very pleased to uh, welcome you here this, uh, this afternoon, uh, and this, uh, especially to this inaugural event of uh, our celebration of our new BFA in uh, comedic arts. As you all know, this is the uh, first such major to be offered anywhere uh, in the US, and dare I say in North America, probably South America too. Uh, and the excitement about it is running very high uh, in the Emerson community and uh, beyond. I know that the New York Times uh, Magazine is working on a piece, and, uh, and we hope to see that uh, uh, in the not too, dear, uh, not too near future, um, uh, in the near future. Uh, this uh, new major strengthens our commitment to the study of comedy by adding uh, academic rigor and uh, intellectual resources from faculty and uh, industry professionals both here uh, in, La in, in Los Angeles uh, and beyond. It's grounded in the history uh, and the theory of, of comedy and it will uh, prepare our students for uh, brilliant careers in uh, comedy performance, writing, uh, and production. And today's, uh, the topic chosen for today's uh, discussion is an important one that is really at the center, the heart of a national uh, conversation uh, around uh, political correctness. And the question that will be posed today is should comedy be uh, politically uh, correct? Can uh, comedy be anything other than that? Historically, uh, comedy has been used as a vehicle for social change as we know well know and um, um, a principal uh, example of that is with uh, one of our uh, uh, alums, uh, Norman Lear, uh, who many uh, would argue started uh, important conversations and advanced social change with shows like uh, All in the Family and the Jeffersons and it goes on and on. Uh, but would Lear be able to uh, get away with what he did uh, in the mid 70s? Uh, today, and that is an important question. There's a changing of the guard, a new generation that uh, embraces political correctness and is demanding that comedians not cross uh, certain cultural uh, lines, uh, uh, and uh, specifically those that, that some would argue unnecessarily target or hurt um, uh, and create uh, places of discomfort for certain groups of people uh, just to get a laugh. So there are many questions uh, that, uh, that we can ask uh, in this arena, um, including these. Uh, is the debate about acceptability of certain kinds of comedy a debate between generations? Does comedy have to be offensive in order to be effective or to, or to be effect or bring about social change? Or are there other ways of approaching comedy that are less offensive but still may get the point uh, across. And that is why we are gathered here today to, to hear different points of view from a wide range of uh, comedy scholars and uh, practitioners. Uh, and so to get us started, let me introduce today's uh, moderator, uh, Ken File. Uh, Ken is an Emerson College uh, uh, alum who earned both his BA and MA with us and then went on to earn a PhD at the University of uh, Texas at Austin. And he's now back at Emerson uh, happily uh, for us uh, as the senior uh, scholar in residence in the Department of Visual and Media Arts. He's written extensively about comedy and much more. Uh, and he is an important voice in public conversations about popular culture. And we're very, very lucky to have him here uh, with us uh, today. But before I turn this over to you, Ken, I, uh, with, uh, I, I must point out in the back, in the red, is this wonderful professor, Marty Cook, who uh, really uh, was the spirit behind this. I remember having conversations with you a couple of years ago about moving forward on this, uh, and you did, you did it brilliantly, uh, and um, Emerson uh, and the intellectual and academic community is is uh, the better for it. So we all want to thank you, Marty, for your leadership. So anyway, so Ken, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, thanks. 
Uh, well, welcome to our panel discussion, pa uh, comedy and campus culture, who's laughing now? I hope you'll be laughing soon, or at least nodding your heads uh, in interest. Uh, this is, of course, as, as uh, uh, President Pelton put it, uh, the inaugural event for Emerson's uh, BFA program in comedic arts. Um, just to let you know, we're live streaming um, for our friends outside the ivory tower of uh, LA and beyond. Uh, so welcome to the streamers. And uh, folks on the web can submit questions to comedy at emerson.edu, and we'll certainly try and get all your questions in. And by the way, folks who are here, uh, physically that is, uh, please sign the guest register so we can keep you up to date on future events. Um, I'm uh, uh, what uh, humbled by Lee's introduction to me. Uh, and uh, so now I'd like to also introduce uh, my co-moderator, uh, Nick Holmes. Uh, Nick is a senior performing arts major. He's also uh, among the first of the comedy minors in, in this new program. Uh, he's a member of the Zach Stetson uh, Performance Group, and he aspires to write comedy for TV. Hi, thank you all. Um, I also need to give some credit uh, to the uh, absolute support and generosity of the Comedy Program Committee, um, including Magda Romanska, Aaron Schwal, Mike Bent, Hassan Ildari, Manny Bassanis, Adam Greenfield, Christina Zaman, and of course, Marty Cook and Rob Sabal. Um, now let's introduce our panelists. Um, and we'll start uh, on the end over here, uh, Sierra Cato. Uh, Sierra is a student comic from Harvard University. She's a senior computer science major uh, with an impressive list uh, already of comic credits. Uh, she appeared on Last Call with Carson Daly on NBC, the current season of Last Comic Standing, also on NBC, season two of Laughs on Fox. Uh, she has also been showcased in the LAIO West Comedy Festival and the Women in Comedy Festival. Uh, next, we have Paul Lewis, professor of English and American Studies uh, from Boston College, Professor Lewis has developed interdisciplinary approaches to the study of humor in literature, popular culture, and politics. He's the author of Cracking Up, American Humor in a Time of Conflict, and What's So Funny About a Dead Terrorist Toward an Ethics of Humor for the Digital Age. And uh, Professor Lewis is also a member of the editorial board of the International Journal of Humor. Um, and next we have Sasha Cohn. Uh, PhD candidate from Brandeis Uni University. Uh, Ms. Cohn uh, explores American pop culture and its intersections with the history of politics, gender, and sexuality. Her dissertation in progress is entitled The Comedy of the Culture Wars, American Humor, Feminism, and Gay Liberation, 1969 to 1989. She is a Crown Fellow an NERFC, and I meant to ask you how to pronounce that, so I, I'll just spell it out, NERFC fellow, and a, and a contributor to the Time Magazine History Archives. And then um, we have uh, Corey Rodriguez. Uh, Corey Rodriguez is a stand-up comic, a veteran actor, impressionist, and comedy circuit headliner. Mr. Rodriguez has racked up a notable list of comedy competition victories and performs regularly on behalf of charitable organizations. And then, uh, uh, let's see, Ooh, uh, uh, uh. okay. A little out of order, but improvise, right? It's part of comedy. Ah, there we go. Yes, I can't improvise. I'm not a comedian. Um, and last but not least, we have Michael Lohman, professor of television from Boston University. Professor Lohman is a veteran comedy writer and producer of a series of iconic television shows, including All in the Family, Happy Days, One Day at a Time, Alice, and New Heart. He has received 11 Emmy Awards, a Humanitas Prize, and citations from the NAACP Image Awards and La Raza Latino Bravo Awards. So please give a warm welcome to our panelists. <laughs> So 
So uh, the discussion structure will uh, run as follows. Um, we'll begin with a brief statement from each uh, panelist, beginning with Sierra. We'll just go down the row here. Um, and that will be followed by a couple of clips that uh, we have chosen to uh, frame the contemporary debate about political correctness uh, on college campuses. Um, and that will be followed uh, by questions from Nick and I, as well as uh, the audience here and uh, folks streaming. And once again, for you streamers, uh, please submit questions at comedy at emerson.edu. And once again, we'll try and get to everyone's questions. Um, so uh, without further ado, sock it to us. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Thank you, Ken. Um, so I'm Sierra. I am, uh, like probably quite a few of you, uh, a student and interested in comedy, so it's kind of an interesting intersection. Um, I also don't think I have like a very uh, solid opinion on the matter because I'm still learning and I'm, you know, I'm sure my opinion will change like 50 times during the course of this panel, so that'll be fun. Um, but I think the main thing that is kind of interesting being a student and being a comedian is sort of this split personality that I have as a result. Um, that I'm sure a lot of people share here today. Um, for one, I definitely think that, you know, as a student and in the, on campus, uh, there's sort of the idea that campuses are a little coddled or, the, you know, the idea that we're super politically correct. Um, and I think I am one of those people, you know, I think I, I count myself as learning about matters and wanting to be sensitive to everyone and thinking in that way. And then at the same time as a comedian, I think I also get frustrated about censorship and get frustrated that sometimes I can't write everything I wanna write or say everything I wanna say, or um, that even if I touch on something without, you know, hopefully not perpetuating certain hegemonic structures or anything, that it may still be criticized because it's a little too controversial. Um, but so, so yeah, so I'd say I have a lot of internal conversations with myself where I censor myself or I, I'm like, wow, Sierra, you would say that? Gosh, you know, you're gonna <laughs> be sensitive to everyone. Um, but at the same time, you know, I wanna be able to say certain jokes and, and make fun of certain things that hopefully um, are helping the purpose overall. Um, so there's a lot of paradoxes, I think, is the main conclusion. Um, and that I, I want comedy to be something, of course, that you know you get to talk about really difficult subjects with, um, but at the same time I understand that you know right now what people respond to best is often like really trying to be progressive and trying to challenge certain things that have existed in the past, and so it's a really exciting um, I think for us who are students who are also interested in comedy to sort of use it to move forward in those ways and to hopefully use what we've learned as students and, and about the world around us to then also use our interest in comedy to sort of um, either you know create discourse on it or um, just talk about it in a certain way. Um, but again, it is, it is a tricky situation and I think I'm still learning. So <laughs> I'm really interested to hear what everyone else has to say here and then also just like as, as we mature and as we kind of go out into the world and do comedy, to see what we can learn from it and how we can like sort of say what we want to say um, and how, you know, send our messages that we want to send. So, thank you. <laughs> uh, so th thanks so much to uh, Marty Cook and the New Comedy Program for including me uh, in this discussion. I come at the subject uh, not from the world of performance comedy but from the perhaps funnier world of humor research <laughs> where public opinion and common sense ideas about how humor functions between individuals and groups are tested and frequently overturned. Once tested, it turns out that laughter is not the best medicine unless there's no good medicine for your illness, that we're unlikely to achieve world peace through laughter, that how one uses humor is more important to one's well-being than how often one tries to be funny, and that derogatory humor directed at a specific social group or individual can have negative personal and social effects. I'm likely to bring specific research in three areas into this discussion where appropriate. One, Thomas Ford and Mark Ferguson's prejudice norm theory, which is based on the finding that being amused by derogatory jokes about disliked groups, for example, women, African Americans, reduces the power of norms that prohibit hostile acts against members of these groups. Two, 
The phenomenon of jeer pressure, discovered by Leslie James and James Olson, turns out that people who witness acts of bullying are less likely to object if the bullies ridicule their targets while physically attacking them, kicking their butts while treating them as the butt of jokes. And three, galatophobia, the fear of being laughed at, a social anxiety disorder first studied by Willibod Ruch at the University of Zurich. Research in these areas has advanced to the point that the current issue of a journal I help edit is devoted entirely to studies of the effects of derogatory humor. Final point about the use of the term political correctness. The Atlantic article by Caitlin Flanagan in September decries its prevalence on campuses, especially in relation to the booking of stand-up comedians who need horror of horrors to avoid jokes, for example, about sex or rape that will make women feel uncomfortable. How the plight of potential comics competing for college gigs compares to the challenges female college students face on campuses plagued by sexual assault is worth considering. Here's a suggested starting point. The term political correctness, however it originated, has become a cudgel in the hands of conservative polemicists, from Rush Limbaugh to all of the current Republican presidential candidates, who use it to mock social justice concerns and empathy for victims. If you offend a friend by teasing a bit too roughly, can't you take a joke seems a reasonable reproach. If a joke or caricature supports systemic bias, mocks the suffering of victims, or promotes a derogatory and still potent stereotype, can't you take a joke is a pathetic and deceptive defense of cruelty. So just finally, to professional comedians, I say it's not all about the base, it's about tact. And let it go at that. So <clears throat> I'm coming from this from a historical perspective as a historian, and I wanted to just give a little bit of that perspective here. Um, and I think I want to sort of bring up two ironies, since irony is a form of humor. I think, so the first irony um, has to do with the fact that the college campus was actually the birthplace of the free speech movement in the 1960s. Um, so in 1964 at UC Berkeley, Mario Savio um, sort of initiated uh, student protests to change the climate of the university uh, to a, an environment where people could sort of say any, anything they wanted um, for, for, you know, to, to showcase a diversity of political opinions. Um, so I think that there's an irony to the phenomenon of today's college students attempting to limit what, what can be said on campus. And this isn't, um, you know, just sort of my opinion. It's actually something that was mentioned in the Caitlin Flanagan Atlantic piece that Paul uh, brought up as well. Um, the, other, the other irony I want to point out when talking about this issue um, concerns the idea of minority groups being offended at uh, particular comedic material. And I wanted to point out that there's actually a tradition of outsider or minority humor in the United States, particularly among uh, black and Jewish comedians. And that it was actually uh, comedians like Lenny Bruce in the 50s and Richard Pryor in the 70s who originally opened doors and paved the way for contemporary comics to be able to use <coughs> vulgarity and profanity, to discuss controversial and taboo subject matters like sex, race, politics, violence, and identity. So the, the edgy, shocking, and offensive material that some find objectionable today actually has its roots and origins um, in these minority entertainers. Other examples include uh, African-American comics like Dick Gregory in the 60s, Red Fox from the 50s to the 70s, and Mad Magazine, which was um, largely authored by Jews and immigrants. So I think that that's an important thing to keep in mind um, when we're having this discussion and this debate about who, who's being hurt um, by this material and, and where this type of, where the sort of idea of this irreverent um, subversive comedy even came from and who started it. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to mention, um, I think that, that offensive comedy can actually make issues visible and serve as a catalyst for conversation. When it does sort of cross the line into what people would describe as hate speech, generally I've noticed that the comedy community sort of polices itself 
Um, and activists use this type of speech as sort of a, teach, a teachable moment. Um, I think that the best way to deal with objectionable speech is to dissect and critique the ideas rather than stifling them. Um, and I would also just finally say that I think the problem is less about what subject matter itself is being um, made fun of or used in, in material and more about how it's used, um, which I think is something that Paul mentioned as well. For example, there, are, there can be rape jokes, AIDS jokes, abortion jokes that are used as catharsis by the groups who are affected by those issues. Um, so just another thing to point out. <coughs> oh, Cor Corey? Oh, I thought you guys were going, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was taking notes, I was like, oh, it's gonna be great. <laughs> All, right. All right, so uh, Corey Rodriguez, see my name. Um, I work at, I perform at many colleges all over this beautiful country, and um, I've just done quite a few recently, um, probably like 20-something-ish recently. Um, I, it, is, it is possible to be uh, a very successful stand-up and not be really, really offensive, but I don't think you're going to be, or not be offensive, but I don't think you're going to be a happy person if, you, if, you don't, if you're not offending someone. And the reason I say that, there's a reason I say that, because no one, I don't care how nice you think you are, someone doesn't like you for whatever reason. In this room, I don't care if you think I'm so even, even keeled and I'm the best person, somebody doesn't like you. They don't like the way you talk. They don't like the tone of voice you have. They don't like something about you. Something you do is going to offend them. They don't like the way you go to the bathroom and not wash your hands. That offends me if you do that. So <laughs> there are going to be people like that. So when you stand on a stage and you're performing comedy, um, I don't know where that person was that day. I don't know what they were doing. I don't know if they had a family member who passed away and I'm, and I'm doing a death joke. I don't know if they, anything that's going on, you don't know where that person's coming from. And if that person doesn't know who they're going to see as the performer, well, then, you know, I think, I don't like when people can sit back in, a, in an audience and judge a performer. Um, they hold some responsibility too. Know who you're going to see. You don't know who you're going to see. So if you don't like it, leave. You can't stay the whole time and be like, I was so upset with everything they said. I stayed for the whole hour and a half, but I was upset. <laughs> leave, why support it? It doesn't make sense. You have a responsibility as well as being an audience member. So that's something that, that I kind of think about with it. But I do think, now, I don't want to sound wishy-washy, but I, I agree with, Paul, in a sense where I'm not, I'm not, you don't want to be hateful, and I'm not that. I'm the same person I am offstage, like the same things that I would say to somebody in regular conversation, I would say to them from the stage. Now, where I disagree with Paul is, is, is the sensitivity of things. Like, the fact that someone points out that you're black, or points out that you're gay, or points out that you're late, or points out that whatever it is, I don't think it's like, oh, well, I feel so offended and discriminated against and people are laughing at me and that's a problem. That's life. That's, in my opinion, that's life. So I don't feel bad about that at all. I mean, I've been places and people have pointed out I'm black and they've done it in a very cool way and it's fine. I'm not like, oh no, I'm black, I'm crying. Like, it's, <laughs> I know I'm black. So if you're gay and somebody points it out and they're not trying to rip you up, you know, it's, who cares? They just pointed out what you are. Um, and then I'll just say this, this last part, um, I don't, I don't like, I don't like the political correctness part that we can't, uh, make fun of certain things, meaning like Bruce Jenner. So this was a huge thing, but I don't think you should make fun of, again, my opinion, I don't think you should make fun of Bruce Jenner in a sense that uh, what he did and his, and his act and his courage and the act that he took, but to make fun of the process in general. We make fun of the fact that we have a black president. How many black president jokes were there? Why can we make fun of the president, but we can't make fun of Bruce Jenner? It's still an act, it's still something that happened. It was in all of our faces. It was on every channel, so we're supposed to be like, I don't see it, no Bruce Jenner's there. It was Bruce, now it's Caitlyn, but I don't see it. I don't think that that's fair. I think you should be able to comment about what's in our faces and we should be able to have some sort of humor about it. But as Paul said, and Sasha said, I don't think it should be hateful. So, that's what I think. 
Well, I'm very happy to be here among so many distinguished educators and distinguished students as well. Since I am from, am from the film and television department at Boston University, and since Emerson is really our rival in this department, <laughs> they don't usually let me cross the border. <laughs> but they relented this one time because they're about to receive a gift of a very, very high fence all around Boston University donated by Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mainly teach <laughs> writing television situation comedy scripts, and so I'm going to talk today uh, from my perspective as a writer and a producer in the field. And I'm going to zero in on network broadcasting only. Um, in the past, um, and the present as well, minority groups lower down on the white male power structure were, were strongly marginalized. They were either absent or stereotyped or hidden or ridiculed. And as a result, this led to and leads to violence against them, problems with jobs, housing, social situations, loss of esteem, suicide, and ignorance and stereotypes. In other words, these groups were and are oppressed. The networks put into place PC rules, supposedly to rectify this. So um, in a moment of being non-PC, bullshit. The networks put this into practice because the networks were afraid of losing viewers and the, the sponsors were afraid of losing viewers um, and also the creative community it was beginning to and does pre-censor itself because they want to get a show on the air. So that's the basis of all that PC um, that's happened in the past and continues to happen. Um, nothing is being done with all this PC to change anything, to change bigotry and stereotypical brutalities. So what PC really is, is censorship. Um, and as a colleague of mine at Boston University, Dr. Deborah Jaramillo would say, it's sanitization of television and sitcoms. Um, I am totally, totally against censorship. I believe it enables ignorance and stupidity, hate crimes, bigotry, physical violence against minorities, women, the LGBT community, and others. I began my career, and I didn't know that Norman went to Emerson. I began my career with Norman Lear um, in the 1970s on, on, on All in the Family and other shows. Norman believed that the only way for us to progress in these areas was to bring it out of the closet um, and to force America to deal with it. But, and this is really, really important, he also recognized that for every bigoted, stereotypical remark, it had to be countered with the truth. So for every Archie Bunker who said things like spick and spade and called his wife a dingbad and his son-in-law a dumb Polak, there was Mike to counter that with the truth. And also Norman believed and recognized that you also had to show the effects of what these words and this language had on human beings as well. Norman did that on all of his shows. He had six or seven shows in the top 10, and he did that on every one of them, and America did not collapse, okay? America survived and is better today because of what Norman did, in my opinion, on those shows. So fast forward to 2015. Um, and network broadcast television, which in my opinion is still in Newton Minow's vast wasteland today. There is one show that is doing something about it, and that show is Blackish um, on ABC, on network broadcast. The first show of the season on Blackish was all about the word nigger and how it affected so many and caused such harm. Um, other shows were how the church has played a major influence in the, in the lives of black families, and it went all the way back to slave days and showed you a photo of a slave who was allowed, slaves were only allowed to have one decent outfit, 
and they could only wear that outfit going to church on Sundays. And then you saw a montage of progress in that area on Blackish. Other episodes this season on, on Blackish include mixed marriages, um, discussion between about a black man and a white woman, um, and another about how many blacks are reluctant to go to the doctor because of the past history of the white medical establishment and their relationship to African Americans going all the way back to the experiments at Tuskegee uh, on black men. And you saw the progress in, in this show throughout all of it. So this sitcom series is not only dealing with real topics honestly, but it's funny. It's very, very funny. We laugh at Dre's office colleagues who are saying the most racist, stereotypical comments and thinking that they are liberals and we are sensitized to that in the same way that we laughed at Michael on The Office and his insensitivity to women and to races and thinking he was a good guy in the same way that we laughed at Archie Bunker saying all, of, all those words. Um, so all of those shows were dealing in truth and as President Pelton mentioned, I don't think comedy has to be offensive to cause change. I think comedy has to be truthful to cause change in it. Um, so my final thought goes back strangely to, um, it wasn't mentioned um, in the introduction, but I was the executive producer, the showrunner on Sesame Street for 10 years um, and worked with the international productions as well. So my final thought goes back, strangely enough, to the, uh, to the Jim Henson organization, which supplies the brilliant puppeteers and Muppets um, on Sesame Street and other shows as well. A few years ago, they created a new Muppet and named that Muppet Spam. Now, you know there is a processed food product called Spam. And the Spam company was furious about naming a Muppet Spam. <laughs> and they threatened all kinds of action. And the Henson organization responded, and I'm paraphrasing, the Spam company is upset about us naming our new Muppet Spam because our product is more nutritious than theirs. <laughs> <laughs> so my question to you today, as you begin this comedy initiative is, what kind of nutrition are you going to bring to it? Are you going to go PC and bury your heads in the sand? Or are you going to forego censorship and show us, show us how bigotry can harm our lives and also marginalize and eliminate minorities? Who better can show it the effect of hatred than comedy? Who better can force us to look at the harm it causes than comedy. Who better can change our opinions, at least challenge us to think of things we never thought of before than comedy? Nobody wants to hear a lecture. Everybody wants to laugh. And I remind you that you are the ultimate censor. You have a right not to watch a show that you find offensive. You do not have the right to not allow the rest of us to watch that show. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you all very much uh, for your stimulating and thoughtful comments. And we'll have so much to talk about. Uh, we already do, I'm sure. Um, however, before we uh, launch into the questions, uh, as mentioned uh, previously, we'd like to screen two clips right now that address the current debate over political correctness, comedy, and it's specifically in the context of uh, college campuses. Um, so first we'll hear from uh, Bill Maher on Real Time with Bill Maher. Uh, giving a kind of overview, uh, and you, uh, he'll explain the kind of course of events beginning with Jerry Seinfeld's uh, comment back in June. And next we'll see a clip from a recent interview with Sarah Silverman uh, with Vanity Fair, uh, and she too is responding to uh, this controversy. So uh, if we could play those clips.
seen the footage of the joke. It was too intense the rock, for America to hear. Watch your monitor. the first athlete who's gone into that. Stop teaching geography, grammar, and math. Brown Those are pretty hard. Caitlin but somebody. Americans have got to learn how to take a <laughs> A few months ago, we introduced a segment called Explaining Jokes to Idiots. And I'd like to bring it back tonight for the benefit of the Spike TV network, which last night aired its Guy's Choice Awards and censored a joke delivered by Clint Eastwood. But we were able to obtain the footage of the joke that was too intense for America to hear. Watch your monitors. Dwayne The Rock Johnson isn't the first athlete who's gone into acting. There's also Jim Brown and Caitlin somebody. <laughs> All right, so we didn't get the footage, but that is exactly the line that they cut. Why? Is Caitlin the new C word? We can't even say it in a joke? And this was on a male network that thinks of itself as macho. But you know, guys, just because you have balls doesn't mean you have balls. So, you know, what is so worrisome about this new brand of censorship is it doesn't care if something is actually offensive. That joke was not an insult. Not in any way was it a remark that demeans Caitlin's journey or would make her Adam's apple grow back. <laughs> it's just certain words that set people off. This is what Jerry Seinfeld was complaining about last week when he said college audiences just want to use these words. That's racist. That's sexist. That's prejudice. They don't even know what they're talking about. An opinion echoed by Chris Rock, who said he stopped playing colleges because of their unwillingness to offend anybody. And Larry the Cable Guy concurs. He said, it really is a shame that nobody can handle comedy anymore. You know, when Chris Rock, Jerry Seinfeld, and Larry the Cable Guy <laughs> say you have a stick up your ass, you don't have to wait for the x-rays to come back. <laughs> That's right, a black, a Jew, and a redneck walk onto a college campus, and they all can't wait to leave. One undergrad from San Diego actually wrote Jerry an open letter on the Huffington Post to help him, Jerry Seinfeld, better understand how comedy works. Now, I sure wouldn't want to be judged by what I wrote at 20, but stupid though I was in 1976, I wouldn't have presumed to lecture George Carlin on comedy, though I... Though I, I sure wish George was around today to write a letter back to this kid. As only he could. But since he can't, allow me. Dear you little shit. <laughs> I'm sure you're busy with your new letter explaining astrophysics to Stephen Hawking. <laughs> and giving jump shot pointers to Steph Curry, but try to get a clue. In the same letter, this kid cited Amy Schumer as a comic who's edgy, but without indulging in harmful stereotypes. Okay, but what about her line... I used to date Hispanic guys, but now I prefer consensual. <laughs> now, I love that joke, because no matter what Trump says, I don't think of Latino men as rapists. It's just funny, because it's exaggerating the fact that Latinos, like almost all men except white guys, <laughs> are more aggressive when they hit on women. Which, lots of... <laughs> Which, which lots of chicks like. So pre-fuck you on that one. <laughs> See, the PC police aren't saying you can't make jokes. You just can't make them about a protected species. Jokes about men, yes. Gay men, no. Kim, Car Kim Kardashian's ass, yes. Her stepfather's tits, no. <laughs> If someone on the internet expresses the wrong views about gays, women, or Jews, they're subject to endless shaming, 
unless they're Muslim, in which case all that intolerance is a cultural difference, which we just have to tolerate. <laughs> because, of course, it's a religion of peace. There's a piece of you there, there's a piece of you there. And now let me explain why that joke is perfectly okay. <laughs> because everyone gets made fun of for something, and it's never 100% fair. If I make a, and the French surrendered joke, everyone laughs. Even though the French haven't surrendered in every war. In fact, mostly in just the one. But it was kind of an important one. And if we could go to uh, Sarah Silverman, please. I've been fascinated by uh, this Bill Maher that I saw talking about With how the woman who wrote that piece on the Atlantic? Yes. With the woman, exactly, about how colleges have become this basically extended country club for four years and the kids are curating their own experience and how it's just normally been where comedians have gone to kind of, you know, test their material or their, it's always the most receptive audience and now comedians really are just like, no, thank you. Um, there's a lot of gray matter for me in this I, because I didn't agree with everything they were saying. Well, I watched that episode. To a degree, um, everyone's gonna be offended by something, so you can't, you can't just decide on your material based on not offending anyone. But I do think it's important, as a comedian, as, as a human, to change with the times, to, to change with new information. I don't think there's anything wrong with changing with the times. I think it's a sign of being old when you are put off by that. I caught myself a few years ago fighting gay. I say gay, like that's so gay. I just say gay, I have gay friends. I don't mean it like gay, I mean it like it's gay, like it's lame. And then I stopped myself and said, what am I fighting? I am, I have become the guy from 50 years ago who said, I say colored, I have colored friends. Mm -hmm. It's not hard to change with the mm -hmm. times. And I think it's important. And when you have new information and you become more aware of the world around you, you can change. I don't say that things are gay anymore if I think they're lame. I don't even think about it. It didn't take long to mm -hmm. get used to it. And to that effect, I think you have to listen to the, the college aged because um, they lead the revolution. They're, they're pretty much always on the right side of history. Great. Um, well, those clips bring up many, many issues uh, that I think we could pursue in the discussion. Um, I suppose the first couple questions that I have that uh, Seinfeld and Marr and others bring up is whether or not political correctness, and of course, I'd, I'd love to hear what your definitions or understandings of political correctness are. Um, but does it impede comedy? Does it inspire uh, uh, the need for greater creative uh, thinking and uh, imagination? And then the other thing is, why the college campus uh, context? Why do you think this debate has reignited uh, over comedy within that context as opposed to uh, something else? And um, we can go in order, I, I, I suppose. Let's start from this end uh, this time. <laughs> How's that? OK, so um, political correctness really is um, a catch-all for a lot of different things. It's hard to really define it. Um, in, in my thinking, um, political correctness is, is really, as I said before, relates to those um, uh, who are marginalized and really lower down um, on the power scale. Um, we often um, do not um, include them in conversations or we put them down without any reason why and we only show one side of the story. It's interesting, I was watching a couple of nights ago, I was watching a Joan Rivers um, uh, concert on television that she did in 2012 and, and, and the theme of it was I hate everybody, especially myself. So she said, I hate thin, I hate fat, I hate gays, I hate straights, which well, isn't gays, I hate all these different people. And then she said, and, and I hate people who are blind, I hate people who are deaf, and, and I stopped for a moment and I thought about that. Um, and her joke um, was a pretty mild joke in terms of I hate people who are blind because they never tell you how good you look. 
Okay, that was the joke that she mentioned. And I thought, well, some people might find this offensive, but what she is doing is she's not marginalizing people with disabilities. How often do you see people with disabilities on the air um, in all forms? We marginalize them. We don't talk about them. Um, we ignore them. Um, and that's a really bad negative. When I produced Sesame Street, I hired a little girl, Tara Schaefer, in a wheelchair um, to be on the show as a regular character. And kids were absolutely fascinated by this. They had all kinds of questions. Does she always live in that wheelchair? How does she go to the bathroom? Does she do this? Does she do that? Kids really were interested. And what it did, and what Joan Rivers' comment about um, blind people did, is it takes the mystique and the fear out of somebody who is different and just presents them as different. Um, and I think that's an important thing to include in PC that we often don't, that we eliminate and marginalize certain groups of people, which we should not do. Um, those, I agree with both of those clips. <laughs> So I told you I'm wishy-washy, but, but, I, but I have a focus. I agree with both, but I think the reason I agree with both is because we're kind of, um, we're kind of glossing over it. No one's like hitting it on the head. And what I mean by that is, okay, so what Sarah Silverman is saying is absolutely correct, but also what Bill Maher is saying is absolutely correct because it wasn't like, Sarah Silverman just used the example of saying the word gay, right? But it wasn't like a joke that was going to cause any sort of change or something that was like we're addressing some, maybe we're addressing like a slave trade joke or something like that where you're bringing something to the light and you're trying to educate somebody at the same time and make a big joke. That's different than just using a word to offend or being, um, I don't know, just being offensive to be offensive. That's different. We're not, those two things... I don't see how most people don't agree with both of those clips. Like, they both go together because um, no one's hitting it. Uh, I don't know. I just think we can always find reasons to be offended. I could, look, I could be offended already with Michael. As look, Michael said, Michael said early on, he said nigger, right? But then he was like, and, and, and uh, what did you say? You said in um, Joan Rivers said gays. He was like, well, she didn't say gays. So we know what she actually said. Right? Was fag, right? Which I just said. No, no, I'm sorry. Are you mis I, I'm, I, didn't, I wasn't oh, clear. Okay. She didn't say gays because she thinks gays are her biggest supporters. Oh, okay. She loves gays. She excluded gays. Oh, she excluded. Okay. I reason. thought, well, see how I read no, that? I'm now so I'm sorry. offended. <laughs> I'm offended. And I would have just wrote something like, he, he left that. He said nigga, but he didn't say that. And he's like, I didn't mean it like that. See? Exact. That's case in point. Anytime something's written or anytime you're on a stage and you're delivering something, it depends on how the person takes it. Yeah. That's how I took it. In my head, I'm over here thinking, why didn't he say that? He said the <laughs> other word. He didn't say N-word. He said the word. So why did he say gay? Right? But that's, how, that's just, that's all of us. But I'm not, obviously, I'm not that sensitive. I'm not that, I don't, I don't live that close to my skin. So I'm not like, oh my God, I can't believe you said that. But so I don't know. I don't know if that gives you any more insight onto what I'm supposed to say. But uh, I'll pass it off. So I, I think I just want to address, you know, what we're talking about when we say the phrase political correctness. I think in the sort of iteration that we mean on this panel, perhaps, correct me if I'm wrong, is um, this sort of 80s, 1980s, 1990s phenomenon of um, identity politics sort of dictating a lot of um, what goes on at a university. So, and. And if that's what we mean, I think that um, I think that PC culture can can be good and bad depending on what it's doing. So, for example, when when it's used to expand knowledge, and by expand knowledge I mean things like uh, adding um, race and ethnicity studies and women and gender and sexuality studies to a curriculum um, at a college campus, um, or talking about being able to talk about um, power and sex and oppression in a class, um, for example, those things, those things were heavily challenged when they first appeared in history. And so, um, you know, there were conservative or sort of more traditional uh, professors and observers saying things like, why are we 
um, teaching non-Western subjects now? Why are we, why do women need their own class? Stuff like this. And, and in this case, what political correctness was really doing or functioning to do was to sort of expand knowledge and add to it, right? Versus the other side, the flip side of that is when it, when it serves as censorship and it, when it actually narrows or limits what we can say. And so I think those are two very, there's oppositional ways of using identity politics. And, they've, and we see them both continue, you know, to this day. And so my opinion about it would be, what is, it, what is political correctness doing to the sort of body of knowledge that, you, that, that lives and breathes in, on, in a university? So I agree with uh, Sasha's comment and the history of this term, but um, I wish we'd just do away with it in discourse because I really do feel as though it's become a cudgel that the right wing uses and very effectively. I heard a radio discussion. They were saying, oh, the conservatives hate political correctness. No, they feast on it. Every time they mm -hmm. can use that mm -hmm. phrase, they are whacking someone who cares about social justice over the head. So if you think that a, a kind of material, that an objection, someone being offended at a kind of joke is being hypersensitive, say they're being hypersensitive because you don't want to get into bed with you know, uh, the Republican presidential candidates, I don't, or you know, Rush Limbaugh, when I use a term which has become about as, you know, it's, it's as corrupt as the term death taxes. You like income inequality, you call inheritance taxes death taxes. But I just wanted to give an example of how this could operate. So go back in history and think about the association of uh, Africans and African Americans with monkeys and with simians. This is an uh, enduring trope in American popular culture. It goes back to the antebellum period, goes back further than that, actually. So imagine, and, and I'm, you don't have to invent the idea that this was used in comedy uh, right through that period, especially in the postbellum period, in the early decades, corresponding with a culture of lynching, corresponding with Jim Crow. And you know, I'd love to say we've moved beyond all that, but actually Barack Obama and Michelle Obama were both caricatured as monkey-like and simian during mm -hmm. the last political campaigns. So we haven't moved away from this. And if you say I'm politically correct to think that's abhorrent, then I'm sorry. I don't think I'm that, and I don't think I'm hypersensitive either. But that's what they would have said at the time if you'd objected to it. If you were an abolitionist and you objected to any of this stuff, they would have said, you know what, you're, well, they didn't have political correctness. They weren't that clever. But they would have said something to suggest, come on, can't you take a joke? I can't, not those. Yeah, I think uh, sort of the interesting thing I, that came up a lot, I guess, is sort of that there is sort of a um, responsibility as a comedian to, to promote certain things that are hopefully progressive and um, hopefully are, you know, for lack of a better word, politically correct, or like for, you know, uh, and so I think because at the intersection of comedy and entertainment, like there is so much conspicuousness and there is so much that you know, a lot of people are going to see and you're gonna have influence that there is sort of that responsibility. And um, clearly like thinking of the implications of the joke you're making, like that seems to be the common theme, especially in those clips. It's sort of like on both ends, you know, as the deliverer of a joke or as a comedian, you have to be able to think about what you're saying and like realize, you know, maybe it's not that somebody can't take a joke, maybe you're actually, you know, perpetuating something you don't realize, which everybody does um, by accident. and. Uh, but then on the listening end, you also have to, you know, not shut down if you hear a word because who knows, maybe the comedian is being subversive and introducing something um, that you would agree with. Um, I think right now also a lot of the issues are that there's sort of this, this culture around like the viral clickbait of, you know, people wanting to be the ones to say so-and-so is racist, <laughs> so-and-so is being offensive, and so that creates kind of like a bit of a witch hunt when it comes to a lot of comedians. Um, think about how like Trevor Noah, when he was first you know, chosen, people went into his history of Twitter and just picked him apart. And that happens to almost every new SNL cast member. Uh, it happens a lot. Um, I think uh, I really, uh, going back to, I guess, the Joan Rivers joke about a blind person, um, I think that that's really uh, the issue of like visibility, of people's visibility is super important and pertinent to today. Um, as an Asian American comedian, um, I think like I don't see a lot of Asian Americans on television mm -hmm. and that was like a big part of growing up that I didn't realize. And then now um, on the same network that has Blackish, they also have Fresh Off the Boat, which was the first um, Asian American like 
a, a, a sitcom in like 20 years since Margaret Cho's um, All American Girl, and you know it was it's it's still on. It like there was a huge Asian American like community support for it because we just want to see like people that look like us on television and that experience. Um, and I remember talking to my parents and, uh, about it too, and like, you know, we were happy, but definitely like a lot of it was like, well, you know, we kind of hope that there will be one in the future that's not just like the punchline is we're Asian, you know, because that's <laughs> a lot of it. <laughs> um, and there is now, there's Dr. Ken, uh, which is kind of just, you know, it's Ken Jong sitcom, same network, but also, you know, it just shows that it's expanding and it kind of like, I think a huge um, thing is that with different marginalized groups, like there's different, things that each one is trying to push. So I think it's hard to say blanketed like, oh, for all marginalized groups, like we just want visibility or for all marginalized groups, we don't want to be made fun of at all because I think it depends like which group you're in or which group, um, each one has a different history. And so I think it's, it's kind of interesting to see, like I feel like from the Asian American standpoint, like a lot of it is just like, hey, we just want to be seen, you know, we just want to remember we're here um, versus maybe other, like I would say, a lot of the issues surrounding Caitlyn Jenner and trans identity and um, maybe they feel as if, you know, her visibility is only one identity, so they don't want to, you know, only have one person represent all of them, you know, um, and I don't, I don't really know, but I think that it's just a very, very difficult case by case experience, so um, yeah, that's one thing. Uh, I think um, Sierra brings up a very interesting point when she talks about minority groups in comedy commanding their own narrative, making jokes beyond just, oh, they're Asian American, oh, they're different, and actually telling personal stories to bring flesh out. And I think that uh, Paul Lewis brings up a very interesting point, saying, uh, talking about uh, comparing African Americans to having simian-like traits and how that's something we view absolutely abhorrent right now. And I'd uh, be quite interested to make the connection to Clint Eastwood's uh, Caitlyn Jenner joke saying someone used to be called Bruce something. I believe the um, fear comes from this with uh, when we find groups of people, be it the trans community, uh, they're starting to be, uh, there's the fear that we don't want to marginalize these people, make them viewed as not persons and uh, uh, demean their experiences. So when people get um, upset and offended, I think that part of the equation is to say that how can we make sure that we're including these people in comedy and discourse without saying that Caitlyn Jenner isn't a person and that her transition isn't valid and we're not making fun of her because she has this identity that uh, she can't really help. So I'd want to really bring up the point, um, many comedians have said this, but recently Gilbert Gottfried did, uh, is that uh, nobody has died over a joke, but we talk about how jokes and comedy affect uh, social conversation, how we view certain groups. So I was wondering um, if uh, anybody on the panel would like to speak to the relationship between telling a joke and its, interpret, uh, its interpreter being experiencing miscommunication or the person <laughs> telling the joke uh, giving off malice or social ignorance and what responsibility it's had to make sure jokes don't kill, jokes don't harm. So um, I think it's wrong to say that uh, jokes can't be fatal and I'll give you an example of it and I'm not gonna go to the Monty Python sketch about the <laughs> killing joke, right? <laughs> So I would say that advertising campaigns that promote potentially fatal products and use humor in their ads, I don't have to make this up. Joe Camel is a really good example, right? Uh, selling cigarettes to children with a comic character. And more recently, you know, children watch about 100 ads for really not nutritionally good cereals that feature comic characters who just love the hell out of them. You know, some of those kids, it's gonna be, so I don't know. And I think if, if political candidates tell jokes that make them seem more appealing to voters and they get voted in and they send people off to wars that we shouldn't be fighting, well, that's potentially lethal too. So humor has persuasive force and it can function fallaciously and it convince people of various things. Some of them result in behavior, some of them result in death. I wanted to go back, if I could, for a moment to the comment that, that was made about um, Margaret Cho's series, um, All American Girl, because I'm a fan of Margaret Cho, and I suffered through that series and watched it, All American Girl. And if you get the DVD on that, Margaret has a conversation at the end with another actress in which she says very clearly that the reason, the main reason the series failed was it was about ethnicity and you cannot base a series totally on ethnicity. 
Um, and that's why All American Girl failed. She said also because I had not found my voice in comedy and the networks drove me crazy. They even sent her to the hospital. They made her lose weight and gain weight and it was, it was a mess. But I agree with that, that you can't base a show on ethnicity. Um, you base it on, on character. That's what you base a show on. Character, it's cer certainly in sitcoms, it starts with character. You create your characters, and from your characters, you then create your conflict, your story, and especially your comedy. So even a character like Sheldon on Big Bang Theory would be funny in any situation, whether you like him or not, uh, because of his character traits, of being anal, arrogant, difficult. He'd be funny as a waiter, he'd be funny as a bank teller, it doesn't matter. So it comes from the character traits that you create, it doesn't come from ethnicity. You certainly should show and identify um, a Korean American family um, as, as they are, um, and be truthful to that and discuss some of the things that they go through and the difficulties, but you can't base a whole series on that. I and I would agree with Margaret Cho on that. Mm -hmm. um, we'd love to get the audience involved uh, at this point as well. So if, uh, if anyone uh, out there or in the interweb sphere has anything to ask. We can, we, oh, uh, over here, uh, yeah, oh, great. Thank you. Uh, a comment which will lead into a question. Uh, my name is Mike, I'm the Artistic Director of Improv Boston, down the road a little bit. We've been around for about 30 years in the heart of the Boston comedy scene and have seen the zeitgeist of what is palatable in comedy change throughout the decades. Uh, before my work with Improv Boston, I was at Second City in Chicago, writing, performing, teaching, directing. And then somewhere along the line, actually uh, created a satirical religion that was uh, designed to shine the light on uh, on sort of the heavy right wing uh, cruelty and hypocrisy in the in the churches like Westboro Baptist, that sort of thing. So uh, all of that is to say, uh, my background leads me to see comedy as a tool, as opposed to an end goal. And when you're seeing comedy as a tool, I think comedians generally have. Uh, two considerations. One is interpretation and the, uh, the other is intentionality. I think we can control our intentions, but as artists we can't necessarily control the interpretation of those intentions. So we have a responsibility to be well intentioned. Um, and what I'm curious about is assuming satire is valuable to society, of assuming that comedy with positive intention behind it uh, as a catalyst for social change or social conversation at least is important. What is then the value of offense? Is there value, intrinsic value in being offended or in offending others as a means of getting a conversation going? So okay. I, oh sorry. No, no, go. Um, I just wanted to address this with a historical example, with a couple of them. So in the 1980s, um, the late 80s, there were probably two comedians that you guys are probably familiar with, um, Sam Kinison and Andrew Dice Clay, and they were sort of considered shock jock comedians, so they were they're sort of traded on being extremely offensive. And, um, and they sort of crossed a line when they started to, to make jokes about AIDS and gay men. And um, one joke that comes to mind is um, Andrew Dice Clay, I think, did a set in Brooklyn in the late 80s. And he started off by saying something like, um, oh, we, we don't have fags here. They're all dead. So that's, that's a very dark, I think, pretty much universally offensive thing to say. And, um, and so the gay community, you know, they didn't just sort of let themselves be ridiculed this way. They staged protests um, to Andrew Dice Clay's shows as well as Sam Kinison's shows because he, he was doing very similar material. And so I think the use or the purpose of this type of content I think is that it does, um, it's a catalyst or a trigger for activists to point out uh, cultural myths and um, sort of toxic cultural beliefs that are problematic. And so they use they use these, um, you know, this type of um, goading or baiting to bring attention, to publicly bring attention to the issues like AIDS. And, um, and as we know, you know, gay activism um, 
related to AIDS really did, did a lot to increase awareness and visibility and funding and policy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think um, when we're asking what's the point of an offensive joke, I, I don't necessarily think there's a point to that for the, the comic's career because usually it doesn't turn out very well for them, but there can be real um, things that happen as a consequence of that in terms of um, community outrage. So, um, I think that's a, good, that's a good question. Like, is there a need for things to be offensive? And I don't think, I think I said it up top, I don't think it's, it's necessary, but I think you will always offend somebody if you're being true to yourself. And so, two examples, like one, I'll take Dice Clay, like Sasha said. Um, let's take Dosh, Dice Clay and let's take Richard Pryor. So then you take Dice Clay, Dice Clay, in my opinion is, is, you know, especially old Dice Clay, is silly and um, not really trying to say anything besides be a little more offensive and know that he's pushing the edge, pushing the boundaries with his jokes. But it's not like he's telling you anything. He's not saying anything. He's not, nothing's gonna better you there. You know, Mary Muffet and whatever, you know, nothing's gonna, nothing. Richard Pryor also offended many people, but he was speaking the truth. You're just, you're offended by his words. You're offended by his life. You're offended by, you know, maybe he said fuck too many times. I'm sorry if I can't say that one. I apologize. All right. Sorry, I don't know. I just slipped right out. Uh, he said the F word uh, a bunch of times. <laughs> but, but seriously, he said, he said things like that, and he was speaking the truth. And that, again, that's a level of offense. But what kind of offense are we talking about? That's a level of offense. That word is offensive. His, him talking about growing up in a, in, a, in a brothel. Some people, and the things that he saw, and him describing it and giving you a vivid picture of it, you might be like, that's offensive. I can't take that. I'm here with my mom, or I'm here with my lady, and she can't hear that. Those things might offend you. But then you have Dice Clay. It's a different type of offense. So it's hard to be like, does it need to be offensive? Yeah, for some people's truth, but I don't necessarily side with someone who's being offensive just to shock your pants off. I don't, I don't coincide with that because I feel like if your brain can create that, it can create something that isn't reckless for no reason. So maybe I could jump in. I mean, I think that um, everyone is offended by something. So like people who say, oh, well, if you're offended by that, you're politically correct, right? They're missing the point. We could find their sore spot too. You know, dead baby jokes go down pretty well with some adolescents, you know, but take them to a maternity ward. You are not going to be admired for telling those kinds of jokes. So people's impulse to be amused is a perfectly natural one. Their impulse to be offended is also worth respecting and also, by the way, an expression of free speech, which is what I didn't like about Bill Maher. It's like I think he's turning the censorship thing around and trying to, you know, belittle people who might be sensitive to one thing or another. One thing about satire, though. We think of satire as being noble and progressive and undermining corrupt authority. You can use satire political caricature either way. Think about what the right has done to environmentalists, ridiculing Al Gore, for example. Think about the Gulf War jokes that got us into the Iraq War. So you know you can use humor fallaciously and it can have disastrous consequences. That doesn't mean humor isn't good. I don't mean to be the skunk at the garden party. <laughs> but, but I also think that with that example that you said, which is great, Paul, is if you take, um, if you took uh, a comedian into a, a, a baby ward, okay? Um, maternity ward, I'm sorry, baby ward, same thing. All right, if you took it into a maternity ward and you, as a professional comedian, um, you know, any professional comedian knows that's worth their weight at all, knows that you're not gonna do those jokes there. So if you're gonna come to a common, you're coming to a common place where everyone's coming in, you should leave your crap at the door, and you're coming into a comedy club, then it's free game. You don't, we don't know where you at earlier that day, and if you don't like it, you could walk out because you don't have to stay there. But someone would say, you can't do those jokes at all. Well, some people are gonna be laughing. If there's a majority of the room laughing and you, they know you're joking around and you're fooling around, I'm not saying I necessarily do those jokes, but I do defend some people who do some jokes like that, especially if they're not trying to be malicious. They're not in a baby ward, uh, in a maternity ward, sorry, they're in a, in a maternity <laughs> ward and doing those jokes. You're not, in a, you're not in a, I don't know, you're not in a senior citizen's home and doing all these formaldehyde and death jokes. It might not be, it might not be cool, but in, you're in a different setting 
and you get old people that are coming to you in a, in a neutral ground, neutral setting, you're doing what you do. So the, some of that has to be taken into account. And if it's on television, you can change the channel, as Michael said. Change the channel. You don't have to sit there. And, and some people take offensive things offensively when they're not – they take things offensively when they're not directed towards them. And so – no one knows what you're going through. So again, change the channel. You know, but if you sit there and you're like, oh, you're speaking to me, and this is terrible, this is all about me, and it's hurting me, then that's, that's a, whole different, a whole different thing. So, so I, another. I wanted to make another comment. I think um, something to think about here that we haven't really talked about yet is sort of the relationship between humor and power. And I think that, um, so, there's a satirist from the 19th century, I believe, named Artemis Ward, and he mm -hmm. is the one credited, I don't know if he really said it, but he's the one that gets credit for saying that satire should comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. So in other words, the idea of punching up or punching down with a joke, right? So you, um, if a, a person with less um, social power in, in our sort of hegemony should be, um, sh has, the, has the right or, or the, the lenience to make fun of the people above him or her. And the people at the top with the most privilege, um, they're going to look sort of tacky when they're, they're, you know, kicking the people on the ground. So I think there's, this, this relates a lot to um, what, what we talk about when we talk about if what's offensive and to who. Um. Sorry, one tiny thing. I guess, I don't know if people saw um, Thoughts and Prayers, which was Anthony Jeselnik's most recent um, Netflix special. And he does talk about sort of offending um, offensive jokes, which is kind of his thing, you know. Um, and I think, you know, uh, well, I think what is interesting that he brought up is just sort of the idea of context and how important that is in a lot of these situations. Um, and in the age of, like, the internet and Twitter and people reading things a lot uh, just as they are uh, in written form, it definitely changes, it definitely can be felt offensive versus if you know a comedian, um, it, like certain comedians can say certain jokes because it's their style and other comedians wouldn't say those jokes, but taking it out of context, I think things can be a lot more offensive. So just thinking about that a little bit, I think he comments on the fact that like his, you know, his style is very dry and often very mean, and it's kind of funny for that reason because he takes on this persona, and you know, you know, he's not evil, uh, he's not actually acting on any of his evil thoughts or whatnot, but it just makes light of a lot of things that otherwise would be just completely tragic. So I think a lot of his issues were surrounding when certain terrible tragedies would happen, um, I events like the, the, the bombing in Boston or um, the shooting of Aurora in Aurora, um, he would immediately take to Twitter and tweet out something that would uh, pretty much, you know, make fun of it or, or lighten the mood and obviously got an, a lot of trouble for it. But I think in his situation, like, that is his humor and people who were fans of his, like, understood it um, and people who didn't know who he was, of course, would be offended. Um, so it was interesting to see sort of how that plays into it and how context is often lost today with technology. Well, it's interesting, too, because you make me think of the 50s and 60s where you had a number of uh, black comics crossing over to the mainstream mm -hmm. okay. yeah. and uh, transitioning from the Chitlin circuit with all black audiences or primarily to, you know, mass culture, mm -hmm. uh, so-called white dominant cultural uh, audiences. And they changed, many changed their material um, uh, for fear that, the Chitlin Circuit type stuff would perpetuate stereotypes because people would misunderstand the contextual meanings and kind of sp the comedian speaking to her or his group, you know, Moms Mabley or, or uh, Cliff Wilson or, or some, someone like that, really taming their uh, material for um, uh, the uh, mainstream audiences. But what happens with um, Twitter and uh, and all that, you cannot keep it a secret anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I suppose, do, do you, I mean, does that change the terms yeah. of sort of self-representation, I suppose, in terms of a minority comedian representing him or herself for uh, a group, even if it's a group that's part of their own minority, 
they know that it could easily creep out and the area. Yeah, it's called. Yes. Well, that was yeah. a conversation. Oh, oh, no, yeah, no, yeah. no, no. Sorry, but yeah, I may yeah. hand <laughs> things over to Nick now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, actually, uh, let's take a look at a couple of clips. We actually have a, a clip of Sierra at the Laugh Factory oh, from cool. 2014. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> and we have a clip from Corey at the Gotham Comedy Club, also 2014. And uh, let's watch those clips. I think they'll give us a lot of time. In the meantime, take a look at this beautiful view. <laughs> Watch you. <laughs> Fascinated by uh, this Bill Maher. I was at my friend's house and he has a pit bull. Whenever I go to his house, it's scary because he has a pit bull and he never locks his door because he has a pit bull. So you show up and it's just a screen door, screen at the top, metal at the bottom. I get to the door, the screen's all torn up. And I get to the door and I'm looking in, I'm like, oh, and the dog's just waiting for me, like, ha. Ah. And I get to the door, I'm like, yo, come let me in. He was like, the door's open, just come in. I was like, you should just come let me in, right? And then he said to me what guys say to other guys when you want to make them feel bad. He was like, In the meantime, anyone know any good jokes? <laughs> and then he comes to the door like he's mad at me. He grabs the dog by the back of her collar and he's pulling her back by her collar and I can just hear her little feet hitting the floor like tuck, tuck, tuck. <laughs> And I'm trying to squeeze by the dog and he's just disrespecting me. The dog's like, hur, hur, and I'm like, oh. He was like, I hate when you come over. I was like, I hate when I come over too. He's like, oh. He's like, you always act like a bitch. I said, I was born like that. I didn't care. I didn't care what he was saying. I was afraid. I was afraid. We get into his living room and he let the dog go. And he did something that people that own dogs do. This is the scariest shit in the world. We get in the living room, he lets the dog go. And he said, relax, relax. And just let the dog smell you. Huh? That is the most fear that I ever have, right? Because the dog never smells an area of your body you don't care about, right? The dog was like, he said, stop backing up. I said, I'm scared. He said, the dog can smell fear. I said, well, he can definitely smell this pee running down my leg. Ah. this time. You can't watch it. Twice. You can't do a joke twice. <laughs> I was at my friend's house and he has a pit bull. Whenever I go to his house, it's scary because he has a pit bull. And he I was at my friend's house and he has a pit bull. Whenever I go to his house, it's scary because he has a pit bull and he never locks his door because he has a pit bull. So you show up and it's just a screen door. Screen at the top, metal at the bottom. I get to the door, the screen's all torn up. And I get to the door and I'm looking in, I'm like, oh, the dog's just waiting for me. Like, And I get to the door, I'm like, yo, come let me in. He was like, the door's open, just come in. you should just come let me in. I was like, you should just come let me in, right? And then he said to me what guys say to other guys when you want to make them feel bad. He was like, stop acting like a little bitch and open the door. I said, I feel like a little bitch right now. Why don't you come let me in? And then he comes to the door like he's mad at me. He grabs the dog by the back of her collar and he's pulling her back by her collar and I can just hear her little feet hitting the floor like tuck, tuck, tuck. And I'm trying to squeeze by the dog and he's just disrespecting me. The dog's like, hur, hur, and I'm like, oh. He was like, I hate when you come over. I was like, I hate when I come over too. He's like, oh. He's like, you always act like a bitch. I said, I was born like that. I didn't care. I didn't care what he was saying. I was afraid. I was afraid. We get into his living room and he let the dog go. And he did something that people that own dogs do. This is the scariest shit in the world. We get in the living room, he lets the dog go. And he said, relax, relax. And just let the dog smell you. Oh. That is the most fear that I ever have, right? Because the dog never smells an area of your body you don't care about, right? The dog was like, <laughs> he said, stop backing up. I said, I'm scared. <laughs> he said, the dog can smell fear. I said, we well, can definitely smell this pee running down my leg. Ah. <laughs> oh, that is good the second time. First time. Oh. And 
then uh, next we have uh, Sierra at uh, the Laugh Factory. Mess hers up twice. <laughs> yeah, no, and uh, when it comes to dating, right? Because, like, the Chinese part of me is always like, oh, Sierra, find a nice Chinese boy to date. And then the Japanese part of me is like, no, 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 find a nice Japanese boy to date, right? And then the American part of me is like, I don't know, they're all yellow to me. Like, just, <laughs> just pick one. Like, <laughs> there's like a bajillion of you guys. You do the math. <laughs> I guess typically better at that, so. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, uh, I don't, I also, I don't speak either language, I only speak English, so it's pretty weird. I'll go to, like, a Chinese restaurant, and they're always coming at me speaking in their tongues, and I'm just like, sorry, you know, no wobble chinglis. <laughs> ah, what? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, that, you know, they, they kind of judge me. Like, they think I'm a little less Asian because I don't speak Asian. And, um, no. Okay. So, yeah, and it hurts. feels a little awkward. So I figured if that ever happens again, I'm just going to leave. And then drive away and crash into 17 cars and be like, who's the Asian now, bitch? social differences in very interesting kinds of way. And they bring up all kinds of questions that I'd, I'd love to have the panelists discuss with regard to, uh, first of all, how comedians um, might qualify a joke to, um, I suppose, put it into context. I, I, I admire the way Corey used the word bitch in a way that put it into the context of men making fun of each other and demeaning each other. And so it becomes uh, not the funny, uh, offensive uh, use of the word bitch anymore, but it's uh, all of a sudden it's about gender and men sort of uh, maintaining or trying to maintain this kind of perfect masculine veneer. Um, uh, on the, so it, it's just interesting how that issue was navigated around. On the other hand, um, with Sierra's jokes, uh, many folks might say, uh, might question their political correctness, except for the fact that Sierra can identify with herself in making those jokes, unlike, for instance, someone like Bill Maher, who is not implicated at all uh, in the jokes he's making about Caitlyn Jenner and, uh, and others. Um, so I'm just curious about the comedian's uh, identity and how that relates to the use of potentially offensive humor on the one hand, and then on the other hand, uh, uh, the way a comedian who, who uh, in this case, in terms of gender, the comedians in the dominant group, per se, uh, you know, the patriarchy, and yet uh, the joke becomes not a joke about patriarchy, but... The deconstruction of the patriarchal norm. Yeah, for yeah. a second, which, which prevents offensiveness but it, and makes it more funny. So, I, any, is that another conversation killer? Any, any uh, questions for the <laughs> But any ideas on, on some of those uh, issues? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I guess from what, you know, those jokes there are kind of ones that I, I do say still, I think. And, and that was about, uh, about a little over a year ago. And um, I think now, you know, I, th I would probably get a different response. Um, even just because things change, uh, depending on what room you're in, too. Um, but a lot of a lot of my philosophy with some of the jokes that you know I, I like to tell pertaining to my identity as an Asian American or something like that, I think a lot of it has to do with just kind of sharing my specific story and a lot of you know how I was raised. Like I'm fourth generation, so I've really I'm really Americanized, but also kind of have this you know relationship with my Asian American identity, and then also I'm would consider I'm just American as well, you know. It, it's very complicated, I guess, and I like complicating certain things um, with comedy, which is very important. And, you know, now even, I mean, even like the driving stereotype joke at the end, like, I don't know if that's a little too tired now, maybe I wouldn't say that now, you know, things change, so it's interesting mm -hmm. kind of to see Well, that. the difference uh -huh. between your saying it and Bill Maher saying it, because <laughs> yeah. he made the same joke. You know? Okay, yeah, true, there's um, that. Uh -huh. And uh, 
maybe it wasn't as funny where out of his mouth. Uh, <laughs> sure, I mean, yeah, it goes back to context a lot. So, so I think I do have more liberties as you know, looking like this, for instance, to make jokes about being Asian, um, and sort of, I I feel more responsible as to like, okay, so what do I do with that? Uh, those liberties, I want to use them in the right way. I don't want to just ma make it so that um, I guess those in power are laughing and those who aren't aren't right. Um, in, in, in regards to Corey's uh, stand-up bit, what I liked about it, it, would, it, it crossed over two things. First of all, he talked about it from within the group as a black man um, and dogs and all that, but also he talked about it as something that's relatable to everybody, to every male, certainly, um, and to women, too, I'm sure, that a dog comes over and smells your crotch. So we can relate to it in both those ways, from within your perspective and also from all of our perspectives as well, which I thought was a, a really good bit, good bit, and based on truth as well. I think, let me, let me say this again. Um, what Sierra's saying too, because this is funny, it, I have to say this as a black comedian from Boston. Um, you find, Coming up in this scene, it was always like uh, a lot of the comedy club bookers would say things like, uh, you know, if you're black, they'll be like, oh man, I should, you know, I'll try not to do too much black stuff tonight. <laughs> like, it's crazy. This is like a comedy scene here. <laughs> Sorry if this hurts your feelings at all, but this is what what they say. They'll be like, uh, don't do too much, uh, you know, black stuff tonight, or or they'll or they'll give me like a backwards uh, praise, you know, backhanded praise. They'll say shit like, uh, say stuff like, sorry, just getting loose now. <laughs> they'll, say, <laughs> they'll say stuff like, oh, man, I really like your act because, you, you know, it's colorless. You don't know what color you are mm -hmm. in it and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the crazy thing is, like, part of you, when you don't know when you first start out, you're like, yeah, that's right, baby. But the thing, <laughs> <laughs> like, I can do anything. It's colorless. It don't, there's no race involved. But as, you, as I've been doing it longer and going to more places and things like that, I, it, it's kind of like that offends me a little bit more than it did initially. Because initially, it's like praise from the people that are running the business. You know, they're giving me praise. Like, hey, man, it doesn't matter what color you are. We want to get you in here. You know, and then I remember I was at one particular club, and I did a joke that pertained to my race. And she was like, the, the booker's wife was like, oh, you know, you weren't doing things like that before. It's just different. I did one joke that had to do with race. And I'm like, I just did all this other time that had nothing to do with race. And so now I say what I want to say, when I'm going to say how I'm gonna say, but at the same time, I'm aware of where I'm at, like being on the maternity ward. I know I'm in Boston if I'm doing stand-up in Boston for particular people at a particular club. I know, so as a professional, you still can dance around it and still do what you wanna do and, 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 and please both sides there. Um, that's something that I wouldn't have to do if I was in an all black room, per se, but then there's jokes that are more mainstream, which I look like a sellout more if I do, and I'm in an all black room. They're like, why are you doing that white stuff here? Man? Nobody wanna hear that, <laughs> right? So it's, it's, it's a fine line, it's a fine line, fine line. And then the way I speak, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't help, you know, even a college grad, I talk like this. They're like, man, you sound like a white dude, man. So it's like, I gotta like do, I gotta, certain things I have to do when I do my jokes and animations and different things that I have to do that is, uh, um, that have actually, to be honest with you, helped me, that seem like it should be a burden, they've actually been more helpful um, in shaping learning stand-up comedy and doing stand-up comedy. So I know there's gonna be some comedy majors that are in here, and it's just, there's just a lot of, everybody has a different road, but that's just part of the road that I went down. That's one of the things. It's the worst when you have family come see you and they're like upset you know, like, you're not like Richard Pryor? I'm like, no, I've been doing it as long as Richard. <laughs> like your first year or second year in, they're like, man, you got a long way to go. It's like, that's why I didn't want you to come, because <laughs> of this reason. I don't need to hear this, you know? Like, I'm sorry, I don't have a whole life story of stuff to talk to you about, you know, whatever. So, but things have gotten a lot better, but those are just early, early things that happened. But I was kind of speaking, trying to speak to what Sierra was saying, just being, 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 and speaking of what you're saying, Ken, yes, obviously a black guy delivering jokes about minorities or race is a lot easier than a white guy. And you'll notice in the, the comedy club, if any of you have been to a comedy club lately, what happens is if a white guy makes a racist joke or anything on the borderline, usually 
the crowd will clam up because they'll just be like, ooh, we don't know if we should laugh at that. And he's like, what am I, at a meeting? That's always his go-to. They'll be like, I feel like I'm at a meeting. And then um, people will kind of loosen up or try to save itself, and then they go from there. But So I don't know if that's political correctness when they do that. Sometimes it bothers me when they make a really funny borderline racial joke, and everybody white is like, oop, not going to say anything because I see one black person in the room. They get like, hey. But sometimes the joke is really funny. You can like, you know, you can let I, I wonder if I could jump in. I'm, I'm sort of, we haven't really gotten to one of the key questions here, which is like, well, what kind of a place is a college campus, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not, is it more like a maternity ward? Is it more like a comedy club? <laughs> like if, you, if you're a student at a college yeah. and you go to a comedy night on your campus and professional comics come in, is it okay if they tell jokes about rape? Okay. Is it okay if they do, you know, like how uncomfortable Shouldn't you be tactful as a professional comedian going into that place too and think, you know, what's my audience? What can they take? What should they take? You have to be as tactful as the advisor is asking you to be. So when you show up at some of these schools, the advisor will say to me, these are, these are adults. They're 18 plus all in this room right now. They're like, they're like let loose. Whatever they're going to hear, they, they watch worse stuff on the internet. Have fun. <laughs> right? Seriously, here's your check. Have fun. Do what you're gonna do. I'll go to other places and they're like, listen, we had some bad things happen on campus. Don't bring up fires and don't bring up rape. We'll go to another campus, they'll say, uh, you know, don't talk about the president. You know, I went to one school, this is the first day I went to one school and they were like, I was in upstate New York and they were like, uh, listen, we've been having a lot of racial things on campus lately, so just giving you a heads up. Uh, it's mostly white here, and a couple black kids have really gotten into it with some of them, and they're getting into it with the president. And I'm like about to go perform, and I'm like, ah, uh, all right, all right. So, so there's always these weird things that are going to happen. So they give you your maternity ward stipulations or guidelines, <laughs> okay, and then you kind of take it from there. So yeah. what did you do after they told you just before you were going to go on about that? So she was telling me not to touch it, but as any other comedian would do, that's exactly what I went for because, <laughs> because I know where the heat is at. I know where it's hot and I know how to, like I have, you know, you start getting confidence in what you're able to do. My ability is to make people laugh. That's what I do. My ability is to help people laugh, make them laugh, whatever. So I attacked it, you know, after a couple minutes of breaking the ice, I just went right to it. She said there was protest that day, but when I got there, she was like, so the heat is on. I was like, but they still came to the show. So in my head, I'm like, man, they want to loosen up a little bit. So I just attacked it. You know, I attacked the fact that I was black and I was there. Why they brought me in? I just lied. I was like, they brought me in for peace. You know what I mean? I started, doing, started quoting Martin Luther King stuff and whatever. And, but it was funny. They all started laughing. They loosened up. And, you know, I got them to sit at tables together, whatever. Like a big thing in the 60s or whatever. I, I had the temptations to just solve, fix everything, break down the lines. But uh, you guys got to watch that movie. Anyways, it was... Uh, that, that's what happened. It was good, though. It ended up being funny. Great. It was a good time. Yeah. I, one thing, just to answer my own question about college campuses, I wish that college campuses would focus on free speech, not just in connection with comedy when it comes mm -hmm. up in this way. I wish every college had a month where they call it free speech month and invite a lecture series where people come in and they talk against the dominant thinking on the campus, maybe it, whatever that mm -hmm. is. At BC, it would be kind of Catholic practice and I'd love to see, you know, yeah. programs that were assailing religion and so on. And, you know, here maybe it would be about the role of the entertainment industry uh, as a negative force, uh, just to go against the dominant. But, but uh, saying that means, uh, doesn't mean it happens. Right. So we, we believe in free speech when someone tells an offensive joke. Right. But, you know, we don't actually believe in it when we're assailing dominant ideology. I just want to put in a quick reminder. We have a few more minutes left. Um, streamers can uh, send their questions in at comedy at emerson.edu. And uh, we'd love to take some more questions from the audience. We have some few people. Hi there. Um, my name is Nick Fossman. I am a comedy minor here at uh, Emerson. And um, a quick story, and which will lead into like a question. Um, when I entered middle school, I had a teacher for a band class, and he actually had muscular dystrophy, and he was confined to a wheelchair. And uh, at first, pretty much the whole class, like we didn't know what to do. We were just nervous. We we didn't know what to say or how to break the ice, how to address the elephant in the room. And uh, he pretty much 
started like you know cracking away at jokes about like you know being in a wheelchair and stuff like that, and it like it loosened us up. And I I just think of that because um, you no matter what the um, position is for the person who's telling the joke, whether they're in a wheelchair or if they're a different race, a different sex, like usually if they tell a joke regarding themselves, like the audience will probably respond like with laughter. But if someone else did it, um, they there would be a lot of groans and a lot of disdain. So like my question is is it the comedian is the person who's telling the joke, are they being like racist, sexist or um, or is it the audience's fault? Are they acting as a way of hypocrisy in a way, whether like th they'll laugh at, the j at a racial joke if that person is of that race they're joking about or if they're um, not like laughing about it. So I don't know if it's whether the audience is hypocrisy or the person on stage. I think Sierra and I are the only different races up here, so I think we should answer that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't think, I, I don't know what the crowd, if they're being hypocrites or not by laughing at it. I think it just makes people more comfortable. I think at, at a certain point, I think we remove the, all of the crap away from it. And it's just what it is. I mean, people get more comfortable when they know that you're more comfortable with yourself. If you see somebody, they got a big mole on their face and you're talking to them in regular conversation, you know, you're looking at that mole and you're like, oh my God, that mole. But if the person's like, it's all right. I know you're looking at the mole on my face. It's there. I'm going to get it removed soon. You relax, and you can talk to them. Right? You can, like, chill out, and you can talk to them, and you can have a regular conversation. Well, it's the same thing. I mean, I, like I said, I deal with it on a regular basis, doing work in country clubs and Elks Lodges and, and comedy clubs, and, and a lot of times I'm the only black guy in the room. That's just where I live. This is where we live. So, you know, I'm the only black one there. So, yeah, I might bring it up because it's on their mind anyways. They're looking at me. And there's things that they want to say or, or joke is right on the line somewhere. And you know where their brain is thinking. So I might just say it. And then people can be like, oh, okay, I don't have to worry. It's not like mm -hmm. a politically correct comedian where I have to worry that if I laughed at that or if I said that, it just puts people at ease. So I don't know if they're being hypocrites or they're just actually relaxing as people and, and being accepted. And I feel like that, that laugh conversation is, is great because they're like, okay, you accept us for laughing at this. We accept you for being who you are. And... Let's play, you know, that's, that's what I think. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that I really like about comedy is that it's like very connecting and you can really immediately connect with people you've never met before and that's cool. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things for sure is that even as a comic from like a certain race or whatever identity, like I can't speak for everyone who's Asian, I can't speak for everyone. So it's like, I definitely understand that I've said jokes and then other Asian American people in the audience or other like women in the audience, depending on what my joke's about, like would be like, hey, like that's annoying you said that or like that's not a good thing to say. Um, and I take responsibility for that. I think what's interesting is a lot of the like tightness that happens when people are like, oh, I don't know if I should laugh or not. It's probably out of courtesy sometimes, you know, like people don't know, oh, is it okay for me to laugh? Like I don't have the background. I don't think I have the background that it takes to fully understand if this is funny or not or whatever. And like, I don't want to presume. And, and so when somebody is up there who appears like they have the entire background and they've lived through things where they can now be on the other side and make fun of it, um, then I think it gives the audience and sort of like, oh, okay, well then I can trust this person and so now I feel like I can probably laugh because it is funny, I just like didn't know before um, versus if there's someone who doesn't appear like they have the background or knowledge to make that joke, like it can be very strange. So, I mean, there, you know, there's a total gray, gray area, I think, but um, I think at a certain point, you know, there should be some sort of like trust in laughter and like trusting the person who's saying that that's funny to them. So, you know, it should be funny to everyone. And, and I think, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of like education in comedy too. So I think like if I'm sharing my experience and it's funny um, and it's my unique experience as somebody who's different from someone in the audience, like hopefully they can then see through my eyes and be like, oh yeah, that is funny from that angle. So I'm gonna laugh at this too. Um, so yeah. Uh, can I say one more thing about that, though? Mm -hmm. So, like, with that specifically is, I have to say this. I don't, I try not to, early, oh, okay, let me go back. Early on, when you're doing this, you, you address it very easily. Like, you'll, you might make fun of yourself or make fun of your race very easily because you're in front of maybe a lot of people that don't look like you, right? 
And so you say jokes that even Sierra said, you see, she was like, well, I wouldn't say that car joke now, it's kind of tired, I would. Well, because you kind of grow up and you get more confidence and you're like, I don't really feel like that. I wouldn't really crash into those cars. I just said it because they think that's a perception of me or that's the perception I think they have of me. And I think they're gonna laugh at that. And I don't, I don't, I outgrew that, that buffoonery, like making fun of like, oh, I'm late, I'm black, <laughs> right? Like just that like stupid, perceptions that you have and you just say it because you think someone else is going to think it's funny. I think that happens. I, I think it must happen with writers. It happens with anybody early in comedy. You're just on the surface. So you'll say that stuff. But as you get into it more, like Sierra watched that clip and she was like, oh, I wouldn't say that. Like, there's plenty of things that I've said before that I would not say because, and in the, in here's how you know. You, you get uncomfortable when you're in front of your own. Like, she'd be uncomfortable in front of other Asians doing certain jokes that she's like, putting them down when she doesn't really believe that. I'd feel uncomfortable saying certain jokes, in front, I used to, in front of a black audience that I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that in front of them, you know? You're saying it because you know white people are gonna laugh at it, or anybody who's non-black is gonna laugh at it, but it's not, you don't wanna put people down. So that kinda addresses more to your, your question. Early on, I was, it was more shady in what you were saying, it's just you're trying to get a laugh with no substance, but when you, flip it and you start saying something while you're saying that, it's different. Why are you making one of those comments? Like make fun of it after the fact, like, oh, I crashed into those cars and then for her to like clean it up after and be like, you guys probably think I really did crash, I'm actually an excellent driver. Like <laughs> clean it up after, you know, and make yourself feel good, but still get that laugh, but still let them know, no, I'm not gonna crash, you know, uh, you know I'm really smart, so. I'd, I'd like to make a comment, uh, bring, uh, addressing your question and also bringing it back to situation comedy um, in terms of the audience being prepared for certain things. Um, when Ellen had her special show that she came out, it was an hour long show, it was a really, really brilliant show. Um, it got a huge rating. Um, and then they started to address lesbian topics on that show um, and the, the ratings went down, down, down and show, the show was eventually canceled. America wasn't ready for the specifics at that point, at that time in history. When Will and Grace came on the air, um, it took uh, two or three years of it being a hit show before they had a boyfriend for Will. It pissed me off so much that I just stopped watching the show. But they were very smart and they learned from, from, from Ellen because they let the audience get comfortable with the characters, with these um, out gay men um, to the point where they like them and then they began to start and have uh, relationships for Will. Um, and, and at that point, the audience was ready for it. Um, so I think uh, the preparation and knowing where the audience is in time and space um, is, is something to be aware of when you're doing a show. I think I saw another hand or a few other hands. Oh, all over the place. <laughs> My name's uh, Joe Madoff. I'm a, I wouldn't really, I'm a student here, and uh, I, I wouldn't really call myself a comedian, but uh, sometimes I get on stage and say things, and uh, sometimes people laugh. It's pretty cool when <laughs> they do. And um, I, like, going back to the college uh, climate kind of setting in uh, terms of political correctness, um, I do comedy on campus, I do it off campus, I've worked at comedy clubs, I've seen, like here especially, uh, people tell unpolitically correct uh, jokes that have not gone well. Um, I've seen off that do great. And what I, one of my main criticisms of the PC movement um, is that I think it's very, kind of self-centered. It doesn't really acknowledge that there's a world that's not college educated, that it's um, kind of not very young, that there's more, you know, real America, all that type of stuff. And um, one of, like, say, uh, you know, we get to the point where, yes, p political correctness does kind of take over. It sort of, um, you know, we get to the point where it's, almost all politically correct, or that kind of case. Are we just, someone brought up Lenny Bruce earlier. Uh, are we just setting ourselves up for another Lenny Bruce scenario, for someone to just come along and 
ruin the suit and tie Bob Newhart's of the world, or, or no? I, well, I think we're in a particular cultural moment right now um, of what some people would call heightened sensitivity. Um, and I don't, it's really sort of hard to predict the, the sort of course of, um, or, or sort of to take the temperature of the culture and, and predict what's going to happen. I, I'm not, um, you know, sitting here panicked that, um, that PC, you know, censorship is going to take over and no one's going to be able to say anything ever again. I, I, I just, I don't think, I think that's sort of alarmist. Um, it's just going to, it might, what might be the case is that the, the college atmosphere may not be the site where um, really innovative comedy is happening. The, that might be the clubs. That might be something else. It's certainly the the um, the PC thing could affect uh, what happens on campus in that respect. But I, I also don't think that historically universities have been the greatest incubators of cutting edge comedy per se. I think that's mostly happened in clubs anyway. Um, so it's not that different right now. Um, and I just think it's, we're gonna see it continue to evolve. So one other, one other uh, comment about that. Um, we see non-PC all the time. My students and I um, are, and, and mostly on cable, uh, my students and I are watching Broad City and Silicon Valley and Veep and Louie and all those shows which are certainly not PC in any way. So you all in, on college campus are exposed to that. So I, I don't think that we're ever going to um, eliminate, uh, you know, worry about that situation because you see it. it. But you bring up such an interesting issue which is that those shows are appealing to local supporters of PC, as well right. as critics of PC, right. uh, along with South Park and Family Guy, right. uh, and even All in the Family. You right. know, I think back in the 70s, it had a kind of split reception. I, does anyone have any ideas about why those programs can appeal to both uh, seemingly irreconcilable uh, sides of the well, I think in terms of, uh, of All in the Family and even shows today, you know, there are people that criticize Archie Bunker as, as adding to um, bigotry because he was um, making it sound good, because he was so funny. So there's a certain amount, a number of people who are bigots and who are not going to be changed by that one way or the other. There's another group of people who recognize that Archie was being ridiculous, idiotic, and, and it satirized being a bigot, and those people will laugh at, uh, at Archie Bunker or something that's going on on Broad, you know, Broad City or one of the other shows today. And then there's a third group who might learn something and might change and might be more malleable. Um, it's almost like politics. You've got Republicans, you've got Democrats, and you've got independents, and it's which way are the independents going to go? I hope Democratic. but. <laughs> Did, did anyone want to address, uh, as we, uh, we should uh, start wrapping up, and anyone had any kind of closing thoughts on some of these mass issues we've been talking about, or? Well, maybe just this notion that the PC apocalypse is coming when censorship reigns. I think this is extremely unlikely of all the apocalypses which seem to be heading towards <laughs> us. I'm voting for the zombie apocalypse, the <laughs> climate apocalypse, and of course, well, I won't even say, but I really, folks, don't don't get too worked up about this <laughs> issue. It's not that major and it's crisis. It's not so bad to wear a suit anyway if you're a comic. So, <laughs> sorry to interrupt. No, no, you didn't. That's fine. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, folks, uh, thank you so much for attending, and the streamers, thank you uh, for uh, watching. And uh, by all means, wow, I learned so much, uh, panelists. Thank you so much. Michael Lohman, Corey Rodriguez, Sasha Cohn, Paulo Asierik, Pato, thank you so much uh, for participating.